What's up y'all? As always, welcome to the channel. So one of the most common questions that I get from people is why I am a Presbyterian. With that being the case, I thought, what the heck, it was time to finally just make a video about it and give a few reasons why. Now, there are many, but I will focus on ones that are typically unique to Presbyterianism. I was not always a Presby. After leaving Adventism almost a decade ago, I was a pretty standard fare, non-denom going Christian with a passion for Christ and the gospel. But after many years of theological study and growing in my faith, I ended up a Presbyterian. I'll start by saying for those that don't know, you have a couple wings of Presbyterianism, at least in America. And while I won't be getting much into the history of American Presbyterianism, I will note that I am a part of the PCA, the Presbyterian Church in America not to be confused with the PC USA. In other words, I am a part of the theologically conservative branch, which has its roots back in the Protestant Reformation, specifically the Swiss Reformation. I'll also say that I know not everyone is going to agree with me and that's okay. That's actually another beauty of being Presbyterian. We do not claim to be the only true and valid expression of Jesus Christ's body. You don't have to be a Presbyterian to be a Christian. There are many true Christians and other valid Christian traditions. So with all that, Let's do it. Here's three of the main reasons why I'm a Presbyterian. So simply put, I think the reform system of theology is the most faithful framework and expression of what the Bible teaches. For those unaware, you might hear it called Calvinism. Personally, I'm a little reluctant to embrace that term due to the massive misconceptions surrounding it. It does not mean that you believe everything John Calvin did. For many years, I was a rather vocal anti-Calvinist type, similar to the SDA pioneers. But as I continued studying both the scriptures and church history, that ultimately resulted in a shift in my understanding. Understanding. I also began to realize that my understanding of Reformed theology was warped. I hadn't actually studied the primary source documentation for myself from the horse's own mouth, so to speak. This is when things started to actually change. Things like what the doctrinal issues were with the Roman branch of the church, why the Calvinists were not Lutherans, why Anglicans produced amazing people like C.S. Lewis and G.K. Chesterton, and why the Swiss reformers had incredible beards. While I developed great respect for the other branches of the Reformation, the Lutherans and the Anglicans, and yes, even Roman Catholic theology with the likes of Thomas Aquinas, the robustness of the reform system as a whole and the consistency in how the scriptures were handled it won me over. The Lutherans have often charged the Reformed with being too logical over and against how mysterious their theology is, and I totally get that. But once I started studying the different systems out there, the robustness and comprehensiveness of the reform system in particular, it captivated me. Now this was an evolution over time, obviously, it certainly didn't happen overnight. But as I continued to study, I began to see the scriptural consistency across the whole spectrum of doctrines, the sacraments, how worship should be conducted, covenant theology, the law gospel distinction, the form of church government, preaching through the scriptures verse by verse every Lord's Day, the whole shebang. Because Presbyterianism links back to the reform branch of the Reformation, it only made sense that's where I eventually ended up. The rest of my reasons are really just downstream of this. So if you're not a Presbyterian, I know what you're probably thinking. What the heck is the regulative principle of worship? Great question. To help explain, I like how Dr. Derek Thomas puts it. He's the senior pastor at First Presbyterian Church in Columbia, South Carolina, and he's also the Chancellor's Professor of Systematic and Pastoral Theology at Reformed Theological Seminary. He says, Put simply, the regulative principle of worship states that the corporate worship of God is to be founded upon specific directions of Scripture. On the surface, it is difficult to see why anyone who values the authority of scripture would find such a principle objectionable. Is not the whole of life itself to be lived according to the rule of scripture? This is a principle dear to the hearts of all who call themselves biblical Christians. So after many years in non-denom, non-liturgical worship services, as well as growing up in Adventism with things like special music and drama skits, I started to feel more and more compelled by the ancient liturgies of the Christian church. One thing in particular was what Paul tells us in Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16, and that is to be singing the Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. To that point, I had never really thought about singing the Psalms. We certainly weren't singing them in the Adventist churches I grew up in, so the thought of singing 
singing about stuff like God aiming arrows at the faces of his enemies, like in Psalm 21, seemed rather odd. But at the end of the day, the Psalms are God's songbook. As I meditated more and more on this command from scripture, I became convicted more and more regarding the doctrine around how worship is to be conducted, what we call doxology, and what all that should entail. Does God accept any form of worship? or has he prescribed what he does and doesn't find acceptable? Does he really need fog machines and laser lights with 100 decibel instrumentation? Those types of questions. The Reformed tradition places great emphasis on the liturgy being saturated in scripture from start to finish. For those who may not know, liturgy simply means the order, structure, and formula of the worship service. Ours consists of everyone reciting scripture together, singing scripture, hearing scripture preached, prayer, corporate confession of sin, assurance of pardon, approaching Jesus at his table to partake of him in the Lord's Supper, and a recitation of the Apostles' Creed and the Lord's Prayer. But back to the article I previously mentioned. After citing Romans 12, 1 through 2, Dr. Thomas continues by saying this, Clearly, all of life is to be regulated by scripture, whether by express commandment or prohibition, or by general principle. There is therefore, in one sense, a regulative principle of all of life. In everything we do, and in some form or another, we are to be obedient to scripture. However, the reformers, John Calvin especially, and the Westminster divines viewed the matter of corporate worship differently. In this sense, a general principle of obedience to scripture is insufficient. There must be, and is, a specific prescription governing how God is to be worshipped corporately. In the public worship of God, specific requirements are made, and we are not free to either ignore them or to add to them. Typically by way of formulation are the words of Calvin. God disproves of all modes of worship, not expressly sanctioned by his word. So in summary, Presbyterians do not believe the worship service is a free-for-all. It isn't about whatever my personal preferences are. It is not a circus. It's not an entertainment hour. It is not a rock concert, or a concert at all for that matter, with a band on stage living out their musical dream vicariously by way of being a worship leader. God prescribes that we worship him a certain way. As a people that love order, Presbyterians take that very seriously. For example, our liturgy does not look anything like this. Or this. Instead, it looks like this. There's no one on a stage with everyone staring at them, your eardrums aren't left ringing, the instrumentation isn't so loud that it's causing most people to just stand there and listen like at a concert, and I love that. The focus is strictly on what's commanded, that we sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, and our aim is upward, not knocking the sincerity of other worship services, by the way, just sharing my reasons and convictions here. After experiencing liturgical worship, psalm singing, and catching myself throughout the week singing the psalms and starting to memorize them because of this, I realized how much I love the regulative principle of worship and the richness of letting God himself tell us what he finds acceptable and pleasing, trusting him in that, and also receiving great personal benefit in the process. So I know people often associate the word Eucharist with Roman Catholicism, but the fact is it simply means thanksgiving. This term was adopted early on in the Christian church as a moniker for the Lord's Supper, a time where we approach the Lord with thanksgiving, in faith, and receive him. This was one of, and still is, the main points of difference between Lutherans and the Reformed tradition. How is Christ present in the Lord's Supper? or is he even present at all? Unlike the memorialists that view the Lord's Supper as merely a time of reflection and remembrance, the Reformed, Lutheran, and Anglican all agreed on there being a real presence of Jesus Christ in the Lord's Supper. The question became, what mode of presence are we talking about? Is it physical or spiritual? As I started to become more learned on the doctrine of the Lord's Supper and what the scriptures teach regarding the sacred activity, I became convinced of the Reformed understanding which is that Christ is present in the Supper spiritually. And all of those who are united to Jesus Christ and are indwelt by the Holy Spirit partake of his body and blood without the elements of bread and wine becoming the substantive body and blood of Jesus. The word of God is preached, 
consecrating the bread and wine, setting aside those ordinary elements to be used for holy purposes in which we approach the Lord at his table and feast on Christ and his benefits. He's actually intimately active in the sacrament, not simply remembered during it. And as a quick aside, this is another doctrine that strikes a straight blow to the Adventist pillar doctrine of the investigative judgment, which claims that Jesus is investigating to see who is found worthy of having his atoning benefits applied to their account. But in the supper, those who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit receive the benefits of Christ's sacrifice. God already knowing those who are his and are indwelt by him. Maybe I'll do a video on that topic sometime, but let's continue. So Dr. Keith Matheson, professor of systematic theology at Reformation Bible College, speaking on this specific subject, said this, John Calvin repeatedly stated that his argument with the Roman Catholics and with Martin Luther was not over the fact of Christ's presence, but only over the mode of that presence. According to Calvin, Christ's human body is locally present in heaven, but it does not have to descend in order for believers to truly partake of it because the Holy Spirit affects communion. The Holy Spirit is the bond of the believer's union with Christ. Therefore, that which the minister does on the earthly plane the Holy Spirit accomplishes on the spiritual plane. In other words, those who partake of the bread and wine in faith are also, by the power of the Holy Spirit, being nourished by the body and blood of Christ. This is a bit of a deeper theological conversation around some of the technical jargon like whether or not the omnipresence of Jesus' divine nature can be communicated over to his human nature such that his human body could be at all places at all times for the supper and some other theologically nerdy stuff. But either way, this became a serious topic of study for me the more I studied church history and saw how central the Eucharist was in the life of the Christian church. The Lord Jesus himself tells us in John 6 that unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. And this is why St. Augustine called the Eucharist the medicine of immortality. Very clearly, this is a serious doctrinal matter. I was not satisfied with the memorialist interpretation or the Lutheran interpretation, neither the transubstantiation view of the Roman Church, but found the Reformed view to be the most consistent with the whole of Scripture on the topic. For those that want a deeper analysis on my position, and know this is not an affiliate program, you can check out Peter Martyr Vermigli's on Eucharist. It is a gold mine. It's probably the foremost work on the Reformed understanding of the topic, and the translation that I'll link in the description box down below is an excellent translation for the modern reader considering it is from the 1500s. So those are the three big reasons why I'm a Presbyterian amongst many others, but hey, I'm curious to hear where you are in your theological understanding and what Christian tradition you are a part of. So drop a comment down below and let's hear why. As always, if you like content like this, please be so kind as to smash that like button, subscribe, and we will catch you around next time. God bless.